Hello everyone and welcome to Biopsychology Lesson 2. This video is going to cover neurons and synaptic transmission. Now, this is a really important lesson in A-level psychology and it's crucial that you are confident with the content of this lesson because not only will it form the foundation of a lot of other lessons that look at biological explanations and treatments for things like crime or schizophrenia, depression, OCD, that type of stuff, but it's also a really, really popular topic for exams. So this lesson is going to cover the following elements. We're going to start with neurons, what they are, different types, and their structure. We're then going to move on to the second part of the lesson where we're going to cover synaptic transmission and the structures and processes involved in that. Along the way, we're going to look at the role of neurotransmitters, excitation and inhibition, and also the differences between electric and chemical transmission. Neurons are nerve cells that process and transmit messages through electrical and chemical signals. There are over 100 billion neurons in the human nervous system, and 80% of those are located in the brain and they provide the primary means of communication for the human nervous system. So we're going to start with the idea of electric transmission of information. Now, inside a neuron, information is transmitted via electrical impulses. When a neuron is in a resting state, the inside of the cell is negatively charged compared to the outside. And then when a neuron is activated by a stimulus, the inside of the cell becomes positively charged for a split second, which causes what's known as an action potential that travels down the length of the neuron, carrying with it the message that needs to be communicated. Now, this happens in this way in all different types of neuron. And there are three different types of neurons that you need to know for A-level psychology. You've got sensory neurons, relay neurons, and motor neurons. So sensory neurons carry information from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. They're found in receptors such as the eyes, the ears, the tongue, and the skin. And they carry impulses to the spinal cord and the brain. And when these nerve impulses reach the brain, they are then translated into sensations such as vision, hearing, taste, and touch. Motor neurons are found in the central nervous system, and they connect the central nervous system to effectors like muscles and glands in order to control muscle movement. When a motor neuron is stimulated, it releases a neurotransmitter that binds to different receptors on muscles, and those neurotransmitters then trigger a response, which then leads to movement of some kind. Finally, you have relay neurons, and the relay neurons are found between sensory input and motor response. So effectively, relay neurons are found in the brain and the spinal cord, and they allow sensory and motor neurons to communicate with each other. So just to give you a little bit of an example of how all these three fit together in terms of going from a stimulus to actually producing a response, let's imagine you accidentally spike your hand on a cactus. Pain receptors in your hand are going to be stimulated, which is going to be picked up by a sensory neuron. That information passes through a relay neuron, which then passes the information on to a motor neuron. Remember, motor neurons are connected to muscles, glands, and other effectors, which is then going to result in you pulling your hand away from the cactus in order to avoid any kind of lasting damage. Now, although there are many different types of neuron, they all have the same basic structure. And the key elements are now on the screen for you, indicated by arrows. Now, it's going to be absolutely vital that you can name each one of those elements, but it's also going to be important that you can actually describe the structure fully in writing for anything up to about six marks. So we'll start with dendrites on the left-hand side of the structure. Dendrites are branch-like structures that receive nerve impulses 
from neighbouring neurons or from sensory receptors like the skin, and they carry that information towards the cell body, which is right there. The cell body of a neuron includes the nucleus, and the nucleus contains the genetic material of the cell. You've then got the axon, and the axon carries impulses in form of an action potential, as we mentioned earlier, away from the cell body down the length of the neuron all the way to the axon terminal. The axon is also insulated by the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath protects the axon, but it also speeds up the electrical transmission of the impulse. The myelin sheath is also segmented by little gaps known as the nodes of Ranvier. And these little gaps also speed up the transmission of impulses by forcing the impulse to jump across the gaps. Okay, the axon terminals are at the end. We already mentioned those. And the axon terminals are responsible for communicating with the next neuron in the link across a gap that's known as the synapse. And we will have a look at the synapse in a little bit more detail later on. Okay, so that is your basic structure of a neuron. And that is the basic information that you need to know. Now, obviously, anybody who is doing a biology A-level is going to know way more about things like the myelin sheath, the nodes of Ranvier, the action potentials, all of that stuff. However, for the purposes of A-level psychology, you don't need to know it in any more detail than what I've just given you in my explanation. Okay? And for anybody who missed anything, you can go ahead and pause the video now and just take down any more notes on the structure of neurons. Okay, so that brings us to part two of the video, synaptic transmission. Now, neurons communicate with each other within groups known as neural networks. Effectively, every neuron makes up like a link in a chain, and each neuron is separated from the next neuron by a small gap called the synapse. Now you can see on the screen there, there's a small diagram where you've got neuron one, you can follow the nerve impulse, and then it gets to a gap. And you can see the gap is marked there as being called the synapse. Now between neurons, information is transmitted chemically via neurotransmitters. And it's this chemical transmission that we are now going to have a little bit of a look at. So, it is known as synaptic transmission because the information is transmitted across the synapse, the gap between two neurons. So, again, just like with the structure of a neuron, it's going to be really important for you to be able to identify all of the structures that are involved in synaptic transmission. And it's also going to be important for you to be able to describe in writing for as much as six marks how this process occurs. So, you have an impulse that arrives at the presynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron is effectively the axon terminal. It is the last little bit of the neuron before the synapse. At which point the impulse is converted into a chemical messenger in the form of neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are then released from vesicles. Vesicles are tiny little sacs that hold various different types of neurotransmitter, and when the impulse arrives at the presynaptic neuron, these neurotransmitters are released from the vesicles into the synapse. The neurotransmitters then diffuse across the synapse. When the neurotransmitters get to the other side of the synapse, they bind into the postsynaptic receptor sites. And at this point, the chemical message is then converted back into an electrical impulse and the process of information transmission begins again in the new neuron. Okay, so it starts again with an action potential and so on, and the message is carried on. At that point, the neurotransmitters are broken down and reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron, ready for the next impulse to arrive. Okay, at this point, it is worth mentioning, simply because it came up in an exam not too long ago, the direction of travel can only be one way. 
And this is for various reasons, and if you do A-level biology, you'll be able to put much more of a biological spin on this. However, for the purposes of psychology, it can only go one way because the neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic neuron and they are received at the postsynaptic receptor sites. There are no receptors on the presynaptic neuron and there are no vesicles full of neurotransmitters on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so it can only go in one direction. Now, there are loads of different neurotransmitters. Okay, so you just need to be aware um, a, of what they are. That's kind of the most important thing, the fact that they transmit information across the synapse. Um, you're going to come across quite a few different neurotransmitters throughout your psychology A-level and serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine and adrenaline. They're just some examples, although adrenaline is a hormone and a neurotransmitter and these all kind of come up more and more as you head towards year 13. They all get picked up at the postsynaptic receptor sites and they are always a perfect fit for a particular receptor. A little bit like a lock and key kind of mechanism. Neurotransmitters also have specific functions within the body. Okay, so you can see a couple there on the screen. They all have loads and loads of different functions, um, but those are just some of the ones Okay, so just be aware of what neurotransmitters are and how they work, but you don't need to know very much more than that. Okay, so coming towards the final little bits of the lesson now, um, neurotransmitters can have one of two effects on neighboring neurons. They can either have an excitatory effect on neighboring neurons or an inhibitory effect on neighboring neurons. So, for example, adrenaline causes excitation of the postsynaptic neuron because it increases the positive charge of the postsynaptic neuron and that then makes it more likely to fire. It makes it more likely for an action potential to occur. Whereas in contrast, you have something like serotonin, which has an inhibitory effect on the postsynaptic neuron, which results in the neuron becoming more negatively charged and less likely to fire. And that works by the process of summation, which means that the excitatory and inhibitory influences are summed. So if the net effect on the postsynaptic neuron is inhibitory, then the postsynaptic neuron is less likely to fire. Equally, if the net effect is excitatory, then the postsynaptic neuron is more likely to fire. Therefore, the action potential of the postsynaptic neuron is only triggered if the sum of the excitatory and inhibitory signals at any one time reaches a particular threshold. And at that point, the neuron either fires or doesn't fire. Okay, that is the process of summation. Okay, so just before we finish off then, in an exam, this comes up quite a lot, and these are just some of the examples from past papers. So, you have a six marker here with an application. So this is a little bit of a different application to the cactus example that I used earlier, but it is six marks, which means that you've got a lot of stuff to say. You need to talk about each of the different neurons and what is happening at any one point whilst Jeremy is digging and then when he stops. Okay, you can have something quite simple, like this three marker, where you literally just have to label the different neurons. So A would be sensory, B would be relay, and C would be motor in this case. So A is sensory because it connects to um, your skin and it receives information, whereas C is motor because it is connecting to a muscle which is then going to move. You've then got a nice four marker, which is... It's a little bit of a complicated one and it threw people off a little bit when it came up in the exam, but this is what I was talking about before with the fact that neurotransmitters only get released from the presynaptic neuron. There aren't any receptors on the presynaptic neuron, so they can only bind to the postsynaptic neuron um, and so on and so on. Then you've got something fairly straightforward. It briefly explain how excitation and inhibition are involved in synaptic transmission, which is a bit of a wordy way of saying, tell me what is meant by excitation and inhibition. But again, for four marks, so you need to be able to talk about each of them for two. And then 
A six marker, that is a very popular one, but it is also a fairly tricky one, particularly because it's six marks, which means you're gonna to want to show off all of your keywords and all of your key concepts. That means you need to talk about presynaptic neurons, vesicles, diffusion, neurotransmitters, receptor sites, reabsorption, all of that stuff. Okay, so that is a perfect opportunity to really show off some keywords. And then finally, this is one that you might come across a little bit down the line. Um, so write a brief explanation of synaptic transmission in the brain to help somebody understand how drug therapies might work. Now, I appreciate you probably won't be able to answer this right now, but once you get onto drug therapies for OCD and you start looking at antidepressants or drug therapies for schizophrenia and you look at antipsychotics and that kind of stuff, then this question will make much more sense. Um, and it's just another way in which the syllabus kind of combines lots of different topics together just to get people thinking about how the topics link. Okay, so that is the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense. There's been a lot of information in there, but it is all very important. So make sure you kind of go over it again if you need to. Um, please leave any questions in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for listening and I will see you in the next one.